Can you tell me the significance that it has in your culture? Um, I think, like, uh, in modern days, now it's significant because it used to be, um, it's a food we were familiar with, it's a food that our parents made. So now it's more of um, a delicacy, I guess, because hardly anybody makes it anymore. It's one of those things that has kind of died off and people don't know how to make it anymore. Um, in my mother's day, it was a necessity um, for for travel. You know, it was something lightweight, easy to eat. Um, people lived by trapping, by hunting. So if they were out, you know, out on the trap line for months at a time and they had pimikan, well, they had a superfood. You know, high calorie, high energy food. They didn't really need much else. They wouldn't have to worry too much about, you know, going down to hunt their food, look after their meat and everything else they could concentrate on their trapping. Can you tell me what pemmican is? Um, pemmican is a combination of tallow, pounded dry meat and berries um, or sugar. If you, you know, if you don't have the berries, my mom used to use sugar. Okay. What is tallow? Tallow is rendered fat from an animal. So whether the animal is moose, elk, deer, um, bighorn sheep, it's, you know, the fat that we use is the internal fat, the cavity fat of the animal. Um, dice it up, we render it, and uh, the, the, um, the product is tallow. Mm -hmm. from that. And then from then on, what is the process of creating it? Um, so after you've made the tallow, you need to make the dry meat as well uh, from the animal that you've harvested. So, uh, you know, you, you make your dry meat, you smoke the dry meat, with um, alder to give it a little bit of flavor and also just to kind of form a crust so that um, bugs and stuff don't get on it. Because um, once it's kind of got that crust on it, nothing bothers it. Then you can dry it in the sun and, or, or in a heated building. And, um, you know, once it's dry, you roast it over an open fire, lightly on both sides. And when that is done, then you pound that dry meat. Ooh, what do you pound it with? Um, well, <laughs> back in the day, they used to use rocks. I, um, you can use the head of an axe, um, sledgehammer or a hammer, something heavy, um, just to get that fine powder of the meat. Okay, so once that pow that's powdered up and you have your rendered fat, what happens next? Um, well, hopefully you have picked berries in the, in the fall when they've been ripe and uh, they're either sun-dried or they're um, dehydrated. And um, you mix your tallow, your pounded dry meat, and your berries together, and away you go. And like I said, if you don't have uh, berries, then you can just put a little bit of sugar in there too, just to get that um, energy content. So all together in a bowl, and then what happens next? You leave it overnight. Either you can freeze it, or you can just let it set in a cool place, and it keeps forever. Like it keeps for a very long time, and it doesn't go rotten, it doesn't go rancid. Everything is already cooked, everything is dried, so it's good to go. Mm -hmm. So how do you like to eat it? I like to eat it with my berries, so the, the tallow, the pounded dry meat, and the berries. Like, not a whole bunch of berries, but just enough to add a little bit of sweetness to it. Mm -hmm. And in an special occasions only, you say it's considered more del a delicacy now? Yes, um, <laughs> because there's not a lot of people that can make it now. It is yeah. um, a food that you, you, you sometimes eat or you kind of stash away, you know, and um, when nobody else is looking or if you're home alone, then you kind of dig it out and <laughs> have that. some with your bannock. <laughs> I love that. So would you explain the taste to me? Because I can understand individually what, you know, what fat would feel like in my mouth and the berries, that acidity and all, but all together, what's the experience in the mouth? It's hard to explain, um, you know, with jerky you've got all your spices and it's super salty and it's hard. With pemmican you have like the powdered stuff so it's fine, you don't need to chew on it and the tallow melts in your mouth. So, you know, you don't even really have to chew it, you can chew it if you want, but basically you just kind of, it melts in your mouth and you just kind of, you're kind of done after that. Yeah, like, yeah. Kinda, it's, it sounds very pleasurable. It's, it's good. Yeah. Like, it's a good food. Hmm. Um, wild meat. You use it with wild... You use wild meat. Do you hunt it? you still hunt it? I do. Um, I, I hunt my own animals. I skin them. I butcher them. Quarter them. Um, I, I tan the hide of the animal. There's not much of the animal that goes to waste. Um, especially in the fall, I will also use the bones to make bone tools as well. And then, um, with like I said, with the hide, I tan that hide, and I make, I make things out of it, like moccasins, mugs, jackets, mittens, 
Whatever. Beautiful jewelry. I mean, the, the earrings that you're wearing right now are absolutely amazing. What do they symbolize? Um, the earrings, actually, that I got on right now are the red dress earrings. So they symbolize the murdered, missing Indigenous women. And, um, you know, I wear them just one. Um, my niece made them, so I bought them off of her. And um, to kind of remind people, like, you know, it's, it's not something that should be forgotten. Um, it's still happening today. This happened in the past. It's happening now. And, you know, if we can bring awareness and try and bring about change, and I think that would be it's a good thing. Sharing the story of the Pemicon through your family and with your, your grandmother, as you said, uh, your mother, pardon me, your grandmother as well, yes. I'm thinking, would, yeah. uh, would have yeah. done that as well, and her grandmother as well, and so on. Um, this is not new. Yeah. <laughs> I've been doing this for a very, very long time. Is you taking part of the terroir um, part of this desire for you to educate people, for them to know about Indigenous culture so things like that don't happen ever again? Yes. Um, for it's, it's been like I had to start thinking of um, opening up my own company for a very long time and then I think it was a couple of years ago I just you know I needed to do something more um, I could talk but I needed to start doing more to to bring the awareness and to hopefully within my people my community or other indigenous communities to bring a revitalization of our culture and our traditions but also to educate the non-indigenous people that hey you know what we have something beautiful here you know and we can share it with you you know we can share this knowledge with you and um, yeah there was clear interest in this room today for what you had to share how what's that feeling like um it was actually kind of um I want to say nerve-wracking um, because I am an introvert and, I, and I'm not a huge speaker so um, me doing a presentation like this is uh, definitely stepping up outside my box so this terroir has really um, grown me in that way. Um, I have to say you were excellent by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and I really do appreciate the questions yeah. um, you know and uh, you know if I can help somebody understand things a little bit better then I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. You had a chef there who asked you really precise questions about you know him saying I, if, what if I want to make this in my restaurant like what should I do? How do you feel about that? Um, I think uh, you know if you can do it in your restaurant and if you can serve it you know, give uh, credit to the Indigenous people for thinking up of this food and share away. It's your story, your family, but then again, the culture of so many peoples here in Canada. Yes, um, you know, and I don't mind sharing that because it's something that I've, it's a lived experience for me, like it's not something that I read in a book and I'm very comfortable sharing that because, you know, I grew up in a very culture cultural rich environment mm -hmm. um, ever since I I can remember like we lived on my parents trap line which didn't have electricity or running water um, Cree is my first language um, English my second and you know to be able to um, I think share a part of what I was growing up because I never felt like um, we were lacking when I was growing up we always, like, I never felt poor or anything like that. We always had food in the cupboards, clothes on our backs, and, you know, we were never short on anything to eat, and we lived off the land. Huh. So can you situate us geographically where that is exactly? It is, um, so it's a small community called Nose Creek Settlement now, um, and it's in, it's roughly 100 kilometers southwest of Grand Prairie. Okay. That's where I grew up. Wow. So is that still where you live today? No, I live in Grand Cash. Okay. And where is Grand Cash? I'm sorry, I'm not from here. Um, Grand Cash is uh, just west of Hinton. So if you go about two hours west of Jasper, you'll hit Grand Cash. Okay, so do you still live off the land? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Hunting, fishing, gathering? Um, the only thing I don't do anymore is I don't trap, but yes, I do hunt. Um, the gathering of medicines, berries, plants, absolutely. Um, hunting, yes, moose, elk, deer. Wow, that is so rich. That is so incredibly rich. Wow. <laughs> um, I feel as though having the opportunity to talk with someone like you who has such beautiful stories to tell and such a rich history that is centered around your culture and your family and who you are as a person is, I, I appreciate the time you've taken with me today. Thank you so much. How would I say again thank you in, in Cree? 
Nana. 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 Nash. Nash. Common. Nana Nash Common. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Nana, nana Nash Common. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>